Hey guys, this is Terry with Futures.io, and it is my pleasure to welcome Dave Force and Todd Holtman of DTN IQ Feed for today's webinar updates and market analysis. During the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the questions box, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter with at Futures.io. And without further delay, I'll hand it over to Dave and Todd. All right, Dave, you should get the pop-up. Okay. Well, thank you, Terry. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. And, uh, of course, thanks to Futures.io for giving us this time today. Uh, my name is Dave Force. I've been uh, with DTN for about 20 years now. I'll be giving you a quick overview of the DTN past, present, and future and our data feed product, IQ Feed. Then I'll be uh, turning things over to my colleague, Todd Holtman. He's a market analyst from the DTN newsroom. His part of the webinar will be a lot more interesting and uh, interesting. And since the webinar will be available on the futures.io site, I might be kind of skimming through some of the details on some of these slides. Hey, Dave, you need to uh, click yeah. the accept on the pop-up. Oops. There we go. There Perfect. we go. Okay. Oops. All right. Yeah, and of course. Uh, First of all, I want to mention that uh, Futures.io is the best futures trading community on the planet with over 75,000 members, many of whom are already IQ Feed users. Uh, to kind of give you a quick history of uh, the D10 company itself, we started in Omaha in 1984. Uh, we were purchased uh, by a company out of New York in, the, in 2000. Uh, then in 2008, a company in Madrid, Spain, uh, called Telvent, purchased DTN, and then in 2011, a company in Paris, France, called Snyder Electric, purchased Telvent and DTN, and just a couple of months ago, we had a company in Geneva, Switzerland, a private equity firm bought the DTN part of the deal for $900 million. But uh, DTN itself still is and always has been operating out of uh, right here in Omaha, Nebraska. Originally, we started in the business by providing a grain and livestock quotes to farmers. Uh, D10 has four main divisions. Of course, the, uh, the first one is our ag technology. We, d we still provide the quotes to farmers, but we also provide analysis, weather, websites, advice, ground conditions, daily market forecasts, and much more. Our second big uh, division is our weather service. Uh, we have thousands of these information gathering locations, uh, like in the picture there. We have over 50 meteorologists that analyze the information, and year over year we have been proven to be at least 40% more accurate than the U.S. Weather Bureau. We don't only provide uh, weather information to farmers, but we also provide it to the NFL, Major League Baseball, NCAA, PGA, cities, school districts. Department of Transportation, Department of Homeland Security, and so on. And our other third division is our refined fuels. Uh, almost all of the gas and oil from ground to the end user goes through DTN processing. And of course, the division that most people at futures.io is familiar with is our market data division. Uh, we have two main products. Uh, we have our market data that we provide to institutions called Encore, and we have our market data that we provide to traders called IQ Feed, stocks, options, futures, forex data, news, and analysis. To get the data to the end user, now when I first started here in 1993, we actually shipped out a satellite dish that you'd set up on the roof, the top of the barn, out in the yard somewhere, and you'd connect the satellite dish outside by a hard wire coax cable to a receiver box inside. Because of the way that the satellite dish was located in the sky, we only had the ability to have customers in the continental United States in the southern part of Canada. To, to view the information, uh, you would put a, a monochrome screen uh, either in the barn or in the house somewhere. Uh, it, 
it ran by toggle switches, wasn't any mice back then, and we could only provide delayed data. Today's trader, we're able to provide market data in over 100 different countries via internet connection. Uh, traders can work from home with a right up to the tick real-time data. Or now with Wi-Fi, you're no longer restricted to an office or even an in-home location. You can actually be trading from anywhere. Uh, why IQ Feed? Uh, IQ Feed provides complete data. We're one of the few providers that still provides true uh, tick by tick information. Uh, IQ Feed is complete data. Uh, we receive our data direct from the exchange. We don't go through any third party. IQ Feed is fast data. Again, we're direct from the exchange, so you, our customers receive the fastest, uh, and we eliminate uh, the middleman. Uh, reliable data, we have our own uh, data center that we manage. Uh, we don't rely on any third party for uh, coal locations, and we are, our uh, data are fully redundant, so you don't ever have to worry about any uh, downtime. Uh, <coughs> Many other quote vendors don't have the infrastructure or bandwidth to handle today's market volume. So re you receive the data over the internet into your computer, and to view the data, it'll feed into a compatible software program. Now today, there's about 80 uh, third-party compatible programs. Uh, many of you probably use NinjaTrader or Sierra Charts or Multi Charts or Market Delta uh, to produce your charts and graphs and technical studies. Uh, you can use one of these third-party programs, or if you want to, you can DDE link the data into an Excel spreadsheet, or if you have the ability, you can write your own program using our API. And now, in addition to just raw uh, market data, an IQ feed subscription also includes real-time news uh, included with the base service. You have the D10 newsroom, you have a program called Real-Time Trader, PR Newswire, Business Wire, and Benzinga Pro. All five of those news feeds are included uh, with the base service. They produce over a thousand stories a day. We also have premium news services you can purchase, uh, Dow Jones, Reuters, and many others. Uh, we also have the USDA reports, uh, Commitment of Trader reports, and many other services uh, are available as add-ons. Uh, this year, we have introduced our new iOS application. So now you are also able to uh, receive markets wherever you go. Uh, at a glance, uh, you can set up your own personalized uh, quote list. Uh, we do have a Droid version that is currently in the works. Uh, the data on the phone or iPad, uh, you get historical charts, intraday, daily, weekly, monthly bars, and so on. So as a quick summary, uh, by the numbers, uh, a basic IQ feed subscription gives you the ability to watch 500 symbols updating simultaneously. Uh, you can pay a little extra and get up to 2,500 symbols at a time. We include 800 real-time market breadth indicators, uh, things like tick, trend, advanced decline. Uh, as I mentioned, there's over 1,000 real-time news stories. Uh, we have 24-5 free live best in the business tech support. Uh, our tech support is available via phone, online chat, or email. Uh, the data feed not only includes real time, but also historical data. You receive 180 days of tick history, uh, over 10 years of minute, and over 20 years of daily history are included as part of the base service. Uh, as I mentioned, we have dual ticker plans, so you have fast, clean, complete, true tick-by-tick -tick data, quadruple redundancy on the servers, so you don't have any uh, slowdowns or downtime. Uh, over 30 years of experience providing serious traders data. Uh, as I mentioned, we have over 30 or over 80 uh, third-party compatible software apps, or you can write your own program. And we have the new iOS application, so you have iPhone and iPad uh, convenience. Uh, as a special for uh, iOS, uh, futures IO users. Um, this is a quick comparison. A regular uh, service provides a, a seven day free trial. Futures IO members receive a 14 day trial. Uh, we waive the $50 startup fee. 
the base rate of $78 a month and $20 a month uh, for writing real-time futures. Uh, futures IO users get those first three months at half price. Uh, in either case, there's plus exchange fees, um, but we do participate in the Globex exchange fee waiver program. So if you are a non-professional active trader, you can actually get all four of the Globex exchanges. Uh, they include CME, CBOT, COMEX, and NYMEX for just $3 a month in exchange fees. That'll save you over $360 off of the full exchange fee rate. Uh, and then, of course, new this year, we are adding the, the iOS program. Uh, normally, we add this or yeah, sell this on a, as a $20 add-on. Uh, this would be free to any Futures IO uh, member that subscribes on an annual or longer basis. Now, if you're wondering, well, we've got the first three months at half price, how do we do annual? Well, the best economic way to start would be uh, with that half price for the first three months. Then after that, uh, at the end of the first quarter, uh, you can decide that you can either continue on a month-to-month -month at a regular rate. Uh, you can continue quarterly. We offer a 10% discount now. Uh, you can go on the annual plan with a 20% discount or two-year at 30% discount. Uh, but of course, Futures IO members receive that first quarter at half price, so that would be the best way to start. And then if you do go with one of the longer annual or two-year plans, we do include the iOS app at no additional charge. Uh, the first step would be to sign up for an IQ feed free trial. Uh, here is the special link for Futures IO members. Uh, we'll make the link available at the end of the uh, presentation also. Uh, when you go, that will take you to the home page of IQ Feed. Uh, in the middle of the page will be a, a heading called About IQ Feed. Just go down and click on the line item that says Get Free Trial Now, and you can sign up from there. Uh, if you don't use the link, um, and you just sign up regular, obviously you don't get a seven-day trial at the higher rates, but uh, you can go ahead and get a hold of me uh, if you need help or sign or have any questions, or if you sign up using the wrong link, just let me know and I can get you into the Futures I.O. special. Um, my contact information, all the links I mentioned will be available again at the end of the webinar. Uh, but first, I'd like to handle or hand over the presentation to uh, Todd Altman, our market analyst uh, from the DTN newsroom. Uh, and we both will uh, be available at the end of the webinar to answer any questions. Uh, it's all yours, Todd. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide if you would. Um, uh, uh, here at DTN, and I should say um, right at the top, I've been in the commodity futures market since 1985. I, I worked as a commodity broker here in Omaha for about 13 years, and by the way, we had a DTN uh, quote machine in our office that we relied on quite a bit, so I was very familiar with DTN, and, and uh, uh, after that stint, I, I had some time writing about commodity markets, and that led me to DTN here about five and a half years ago, and I've been working in the newsroom as a market analyst uh, the last four years here. So I've enjoyed it very much, and uh, it, it fills my knack and uh, constant curiosity of how do markets work and, and how to figure them out and, and get the most out of them. So uh, I've been at this quite a while, and um, it brings a lot of experience. And one of the things that I appreciated when I got here was DTN's six market factor strategy. And this was actually a, a concept that was designed by our senior analyst, Darren Newsom, uh, some 10 years or more ago. And basically, I know what he was trying to do. Uh, being frustrated with, uh, you know, depending on news, which sometimes is true and sometimes isn't true, sometimes on, uh, depending on government reports, which sometimes are true and sometimes not, he was trying to figure out what is the, uh, if, if we didn't have any of the that news or government issued reports or so forth to rely on and just looked at the markets only, what could we glean and learn from the markets that would help us understand what's going on. And he came up with these six market factors. And if I had an analogy for this, I would say if you had a, uh, a trading approach and you wanted to put together a group of advisors 
uh, these six factors would be like six uh, guys at your table, each with unique and different perspectives. So the one thing I like about this is that it forces us, every time we look at a market, to look at the market from different angles. So let me just go through uh, quickly what they are here. The first one is probably no surprise to anybody that's traded for very long at all, and that is trend. Uh, trend is not always right, but the nice thing about trend, as you know, uh, trading is that you're not wrong for long. And uh, that's uh, one of the most important things uh, probably about it from a trading standpoint. Um, it, we also see times when, you know, the market just intrinsically knows things or shows things that maybe isn't well understood in public knowledge. And, and that's uh, those kinds of times trend really shines. So probably uh, our biggest seat at the table, I would have to say, uh, always goes to trend. Sometimes it can be overruled by other factors, but that's always one of the chief and first things we look at. Uh, the second factor is the non-commercial or the speculative positions, and we get this from CFTC data primarily. And what we're interested in there is not only what is their opinion of the market, but um, it, we also can use it as a contrarian sentiment type of indicator. Uh, is our speculating our speculative positions getting pretty large here? Are, uh, if, if somebody's getting, if the group is getting too bullish, is it time to raise a caution flag for the market, or, or are people just uh, excessively bearish? Is it time to look for a low? So, um, also, uh, uh, I guess I, I could talk a long time about this, but sometimes when you see major bull markets, it's powered by the non-commercials, and, and we have a lot of respect for what they're doing and what their opinions are. So that's a big factor we look at. The third factor are the commercial positions. Now, non-commercials, I should say, the, the speculators, tend to be trend followers primarily. And, th and they just are by uh, virtue of their situation. They don't have the uh, physical uh, commodities to hedge typically. They're not in the business uh, where they can lay off risk that way. So almost by necessity, they have to be some form of a trend follower or risk manager. Commercials are uh, just the opposite. I think of almost a Ben Graham value position when I think of commercial behavior in the markets, and, and primarily um, commercials in ag and physical commodities, uh, you will see them quite often responding to economic value. So for instance, uh, if corn is so cheap that Cargill looks at the market and says, you know what, we can move this corn at a profit or we can process it into ethanol or whatever and lock in the profit margin they're going for it well that's a that's an important clue for the market so I, I uh, and as we'll see in the examples that I'm going to show ahead one of the uh, best clues I look for when I'm looking for a, a, a long term or an important market low in uh, commodities or what are the commercial stance are they actually uh, neutral or even long uh, the fourth factor, seasonal tendencies. Now, this is going to apply more to our ag markets and the energy markets. Uh, it doesn't apply across the board for all commodities uh, or financial futures for that matter, of course. But for our ag grain markets, uh, seasonals is very important to us. Uh, fifthly, price probability. And probably the best way to think about this is uh, historically, where does that price fall? Uh, compared to past prices. So are we at five-year lows or are we at record highs like we are in the stock market, et cetera? It's just good to know where we're at and where we have a handle on. And then lastly, the sixth factor is volatility. No matter what market we look at, there's always a certain level of noise, and it's very important uh, to us to define what a normal level of noise is, and uh, that has ramifications for helping us see the underlying trend and also understanding um, uh, what kind of risk we're typically looking at. It also plays a part, uh, it, for our grain customers, it plays a part in looking at timing of option strategies. So uh, last but not least, uh, even though we focus on these six market factors and they're basically uh, market-based clues, we also include fundamental information. I'm not saying and we don't look at the news, we don't look at the, the government reports. Of course we do. We put it all together and uh, 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 try to come up with, with a, a coherent picture. And as Dave mentioned, we also have a strong 
weather resource here at DTN, and we certainly use that uh, where applicable uh, in our grain markets, but uh, also in energies. So Dave, go ahead and uh, bring us to the next slide. Thank you. Now, before we start looking at some specific examples, and, and if that last part sounded a little theoretical to you, believe me, I'll get some specific examples here, and hopefully it'll make a little more sense. But before we do that, Everything we look at, uh, whenever we look at markets, there's always a context to consider. So I didn't want to get into our examples today without just kind of pausing to consider what's the big picture of the world economy right now. And right now, the world economy's growth rate is fairly low, but it looks to be improving. I don't know if you heard, uh, but the IMF came out with new forecasts last week, and they're expecting slightly higher growth. In 2017, we're also seeing anecdotal evidence that perhaps China, uh, their economy is picking up, and uh, of course that has a big ramification for our commodity markets. Uh, second, uh, uh, the world right now at this particular time is awash in cheap oil. Uh, energy costs are relatively low. That uh, tends to favor economic growth. Uh, food prices are cheap. We've had four years in a row of good global weather. So overall, uh, those grain prices, the feed costs, and et cetera, those food prices are fairly cheap. There's always uh, exceptions, but I'm, I'm just speaking in broad general terms here. Uh, I would also say our financial stresses are currently low, especially if we think back to 2008 and the hangover effect of all of that. Uh, right now, we haven't had uh, serious bank failures or, or uh, anything to really scare investors out of the market. So. Uh, I'd say our stress level is fairly low right now. That doesn't mean there aren't uh, certain risks on the board. I was talking to Dave earlier that, uh, you know, this North Korean situation obviously is a concern and uh, could change the market environment overnight. Uh, things like France's election and the ramifications for Europe, those things could also upset markets. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, we're all, all risk-free, but just the current situation right now uh, there's not a lot of stress I don't see in the market. And then finally, our U.S. interest rates, as you know, have been uh, coming up gradually, but we still have to say that overall they're low, they're accommodative for growth, and uh, even though they are gradually rising and probably will continue to do so, at least if we continue to see that uh, gradual economic improvement that we're seeing not only here in the U.S., but also um, elsewhere in the world. So put this all together, and what does it mean right now? Uh, basically, this, I, as I see it, is a low-stress environment for owning stocks. Uh, now, I understand we're at high prices. We're at some of the highest prices ever uh, for stocks. But as far as stress is on the market right now, there's not a lot of uh, stress that I see for, for uh, the stock market currently. Rising stress for owning bonds, obviously those rate hikes, uh, can become a bit of a threat later. We've seen bonds uh, sell off quite a bit lately, so there is a little more caution about owning long-term bonds in an in, in a environment where the interest rate's rising. And lastly, uh, this overall is a good demand environment for commodities. Now, most commodities are beat down. They're near multi-year lows. We have surpluses in a lot of situation for commodities, basically because we've had slow world growth and as I mentioned, we've had four years in a row of good global weather, and this could be year number five, uh, for all we know, the way things are looking right now. So, uh, okay. Anyway, that just helps us get an overview. So let's come to our first market example. And uh, here's the chart that I want to put out uh, in front of you, and it'll take me uh, just a little bit to explain this. So uh, our first chart here is spot copper, or the front month of futures contract. Uh, on a weekly basis, and as you see, uh, we've got January 2016 on the left end of the chart up to uh, as of Friday's uh, close on the right end. The, it, we're divided into three panes here. At the top uh, upper pane, we have the weekly prices. You see a blue line, which is a six-month moving average, and now you see a, a, an envelope, a red envelope line around the blue line, and the red envelope signifies one standard deviation of volatility. Now, how did I come up with that? Um, one of the things uh, that you'll notice over time is that prices tend 
to trade around moving averages. And a uh, moving average is almost like a home base for a price. And there's a certain amount of volatility. And so if we compare price movement to the moving average over a long period of time, in this case I compared over 29 years, uh, we get a, a certain level of normal volatility. So one standard deviation of that price movement uh, in the case of copper is represented by a 12% bracket around the moving average. So this gives us a, um, uh, a fairly consistent definition of where we might expect low prices and where we might expect high prices as the copper prices rotate. So um, starting, let me take you back to the left hand of the chart. We're in January 2016, and if you see there, the copper price uh, dipped under $2 uh, briefly in January of 2016. At the time, that was about uh, its lowest price in seven years. So uh, according to the volatility band that we have here, it was also on the lower end of volatility. Now let's bring our focus to the middle pane. In the middle pane, you see a histogram of blue and red bars. The blue bars represent commercial open interest. In January, where you see the blue bars pointed upward, that means that commercials were net long copper at those at that price, uh, those particular prices, and especially in January when it dipped below $2 uh, a pound. Um, so th there right there is a very nice example of copper offering a cheap historic price and then getting a confirmation of support from commercials going that long. Now I should say commercial behavior does not typically go net long in most commodities. Uh, it's somewhat uh, unusual and it only happens typically when the commodity is so cheap that it's offering good economic value and that's what happened in copper. So if uh, you notice not only did commercials go net long in January, um, they also showed uh, a little net long behavior in like May and June when prices dipped a little lower and they had another little flurry there right at the 1st of September. So every time copper was dipping into that low $2 price range, we were seeing commercial support uh, from the CFTC data. And that's a very good, um, I, I think, logical uh, sign of, of fundamental support for a market that doesn't really depend on anyone's opinion but you see it right there from the commercials who knew the most about copper demand. Uh, and that's the, the commercials that, that deal in copper every day. Uh, now, moving forward in the chart, as we get to uh, late October, early November, we see copper prices starting to come up a little bit. And there had been a little bit of talk about China uh, uh, showing some economic improvement. And then, of course, the big spike up in, in uh, about the second week in November there, I think it is, it was, or might have been the first week in November, but it, it was obviously the presidential election. So there we had a, a bullish trigger. And there you see the red bars uh, start to point up now. So now we have the non-commercials or the large speculators uh, getting involved in the long side of copper. And the overall thinking was, that, okay, President Trump was elected, they're gonna push through an infrastructure uh, spending bill, and it's uh, gonna be good for copper. And at the same time, uh, as I mentioned before, there was uh, some talk that China was doing better. So those two things uh, really uh, got the market excited, got a little speculative buying in there, and obviously pushed the trend higher. Now, since uh, February, you'll notice, uh, looks like copper prices peaked just below about 280. But since that time, uh, the, the speculative level of interest has been coming down slowly week by week the past few months. That's actually, I think, a healthy sign. Basically, we got in a situation where the market was very excited. It had a big run up uh, and, and drew a lot of speculator attention but now we're in somewhat of a corrective mode. So we see prices coming down slowly, 
wearing out speculators and and basically I, I consider it a healthy sign uh, if we could get that speculator count uh, down some more. Overall, the macro view of copper I think is still uh, lends itself to uh, uptrends when they happen, but right now we're in a bit of a corrective mode. Finally, uh, the third pane on the bottom is the weekly stochastic. Now, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the stochastic indicator. Obviously, it's a, a popular trader tool, and I've always had difficulty with the stochastic. If you look at it on a daily or intraday basis, maybe some of you guys uh, can do much better with that than I have, but uh, for weekly and monthly, I, I find it very interesting, especially when these other signals line up. Uh, sometimes they can they can denote very nice changes uh, in in the, the markets at, at key times. So, for instance, in January, when we were seeing very cheap copper prices and we were seeing commercials net long, well, toward the end of January, we start to see that weekly stochastic turn up. To me, that's a very nice bull signal. Uh, of higher prices ahead. Um, and, and conversely, uh, uh, when we get to late January and we have high speculative interest and our prices are up near the upper end and even above our, our band of normal volatility, and then in February we see the stochastic start turning lower, that seems uh, uh, to me to be a good sign of things starting to cool off. So. Uh, this is the, the weekly chart. Now, Dave, if you could take us to the daily chart. Okay. Uh, this is July copper contracts simply on a daily chart. And the uh, red bracketing that you see around prices is uh, a Donchian channel of five weeks. Now, uh, I don't know. Uh, Richard Donchian is a, a very well-known uh, guy for his trend-following system. Most people know him for the four-week rule. Uh, and it's very simple. It basically says if prices trade above their highest level of the past four weeks, you go long. And if prices trade below their lowest level of the past four weeks, you go short. And um, uh, this uh, method of his, devised in the 1950s, I understand, uh, has worked very well for all kinds of different markets um, and through many years. And it's been tested by uh, all kinds of uh, different services and different research, and it's and it's always come out very well. Um, I myself did some studies uh, of the Donchian method last year uh, here at DTN, and I applied it to our grain markets, and I tested different time periods because I wasn't convinced that four-week rule maybe was uh, the best. It seemed like a short time frame to me. So after looking at corn and soybeans and so forth and testing different time frames, uh, over the last, uh, I forget, it was either 15 or 20 years, um, I came out with uh, the five-week range actually looking better uh, to me than the four-week. And uh, it just gave the market that much more room to stay in a trend and uh, seems to do very well. So if, if you use the Donchian rule here in copper, it worked very nicely. Right around election time, you had a bullish breakout in the market around, say, 225. Uh, and it kept you uh, in the game higher through until early March when uh, prices finally broke to a new low. And so right now, as I see it, July copper is in somewhat of a corrective mode. I think we're still kind of uh, washing out some of that speculator enthusiasm. Um, but overall, uh, I think the macro view is still favorable. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, all right, I was told there might be some uh, uh, people on the call that have an interest in the stock market or E-mini, so I, I didn't want to miss a chance to talk about the stock market. Here we have a very similar look at the S&P 500 index. In the case of the S&P, uh, the blue line again is the six-month moving average, and the red bracket around it is one standard deviation of volatility. In the case of the S&P, that's a 10% band. Uh, around the six-month moving average and uh, tends to work out fairly well in, in times of normal trading. Again, if we go back to the left side of the chart and look at January and February, that seemed to be uh, our real opportunistic time for our stock market. 
uh, we had a nice sell-off. We were uh, at the lower end of the volatility band. In fact, we had traded lower uh, a couple times uh, in January and February. Now, in this case, um, I don't really pay attention to commercial CFTC data for S&P 500 futures because to me, uh, commercials just, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's not like corn or, or copper uh, where you have a business that's actually trading the product and hedging or, or locking up certain profit opportunities. So what does make sense, though, is to watch the speculative open interest or uh, what the Fed calls non-commercials. So here in January and February, you see the speculative open interest is fairly heavily short. Uh, obviously, it goes with the downtrend and the sell-off that we saw in January. And you see the weekly stochastic at a, at a low level. And there in mid to late February, you see a turn higher in the weekly stochastic. And that was a very nice buy opportunity coming off that lower volatility band. Um, now, when we get to August, uh, we could say we, we could see obvious reasons for concern there. We're trading at or near the upper end of expected volatility. And we see a speculative open interest uh, on the bullish side now. It's increased somewhat. So uh, we do see a little bit of a sell-off after that. And, and the stochastic, uh, again, is in a overbought condition and starts to turn lower. So we have a few things coming together there to at least suggest uh, some, some type of sell-off or cooling off. By the time we get to November, though, as you all know, uh, President Trump gets elected. It's a surprise. The Republicans control the House and the Senate, and it looks like it's going to be a big uh, pro-business uh, type move. So we got uh, quite a bullish response off the election results. The uh, speculative in open interest uh, initially was bearish, which is curious to me. I don't know if they were just uh, uh, suspicious of that quick of an up mood and, and tried to fade it or, or what was happening there. But eventually they came around by March and turned, I would say, moderately uh, a bullish in the market. It doesn't look like too heavy a position. Um, right now, as we look at things, we see prices coming off of the upper volatility band. It looks somewhat similar to copper to me uh, in a less dramatic sense maybe, but where uh, uh, some of the enthusiasm is coming out of the market and we're seeing uh, on the stochastic uh, that the stochastic has turned lower, which is a sign of waning momentum. As far as uh, the, the fundamental value of the S&P 500, um, now, everybody knows we're at record high prices. We've never traded this high before. But how does it look earnings-wise? Uh, I, I don't think our P.E. ratio is anything near what it was in 2000. Uh, as I understand right now, it's about 25 times earnings for the, the broad uh, S&P 500. So if we flip that around, that's an earnings yield of roughly 4%. Well, if we compare that to our 10-year T-note, which is earning about 2.3%, it still gives a slight edge to the stock market. That doesn't mean there's not risk here and there, and there couldn't be uh, corrective sell-offs. But so far, I, I don't um, find merit in the headlines that suggest just because we're at record high prices uh, that uh, it necessarily means we're at some frothy level fundamentally. Uh, if we could see the next slide, Dave. Um, Similar to copper, now uh, we hone in on the daily chart for the June E-mini, and we see a buy signal on the, the five-week rule, which is a, a, a great way of following trend. And we see a breakout of a, a new high in, in uh, early November after the election. And uh, obviously that carried through. Uh, and um, it really, uh, I think, is still technically in an up, uptrend. Now, um, in March, uh, late March, where you see that red arrow, we did have a time uh, intraday where we traded at a new five-week low, but we never uh, got a, a close. So, uh, you know, make that judgment call yourself. I think overall, the way the market's held uh, the low of that day so far 
which is at 2318 right now and is the current five week low uh, you could say is kind of the ledge of support for us right now so um, I'm not sure uh, I, I'm too enthused about stocks going a lot higher from here I mean I, I think the best of the rally has uh, been seen already uh, I, I'd personally be more comfortable if we saw a little more of a correction and pull back in prices before we tried anything again but so far I have to say I, I think it's holding support fairly well uh, above that 2318 level okay Dave if you want to go to the next slide okay um, this is uh, this is in my wheelhouse a little bit of uh, I write grain markets every uh, about grain markets every day for for DTN here for our ag customers and uh, this is one of the interesting things uh, happening uh, in, a, in uh, among ag futures. Now, um, most grains right now, uh, if you looked at them, they're in very bearish situations. We, as I mentioned, we had four good growing years behind us. We've got a big, huge surplus of corn and wheat and uh, a little bigger surplus of soybeans this year. We had a record crop in the fall. Brazil just had a record crop uh, in early 2017, and it looks like we're going to have record soybean plantings this spring. So you put it all together, and that looks uh, extremely bearish. But here's one little situation within that environment uh, where there's, a, I think, a chance uh, for a bullish play possibly coming up ahead. So this is July soybean oil, which is one of the products of soybeans, and it's been in a downtrend basically for four months or um, all this year uh, and as you see uh, on the chart it's gotten to the lower end of its expected volatility uh, here in April at the same time we see commercials turning net long in soybean oil uh, and again it's rather unusual commercials don't usually go net long in their commodities unless they represent exceptionally good value and I think that's what we're starting to see here. Uh, also, the, the other uh, side story going along with this is uh, a big part of soybean oil demand is used for biodiesel. And um, here in the U.S., we produce our own biodiesel, but we also import a lot from Argentina. Well, I don't know if you've heard in the news lately, but there's been uh, uh, allegations brought against Argentina that they've been unfairly subsidizing and dumping their biodiesel in US markets so the Commerce Department is currently investigating that and they're supposed to have uh, a, a preliminary decision either in August or October later this year um, but let me back up a little bit and say a couple months ago right at the end of February there was a rumor circulating, which was never confirmed, by the way, but the rumor was circulating that the Trump administration was considering uh, re-proposing re, uh, the biodiesel tax credit once again. But this time, unlike previous times, it would only be applied to U.S. Uh, sourced soybean oil and not to foreign sourced uh, biodiesel, I should say. Uh, the old law actually uh, allowed the tax credit to also be paid to biodiesel that had come from other places, including Argentina. And it's, it was a, um, a feature that the biodiesel industry uh, fought and tried to change uh, to no avail yet. But um, they may have a sympathetic ear with the Trump administration, or at least that's the common wisdom, because it certainly goes with the uh, America first type of a uh, uh, theme that that the White House wants to project so between that rumor and the, the talk of the Commerce Department possibly getting involved with um, uh, bringing these charges against Argentina obviously the, the the proposed remedy would probably be if it came through some form of uh, countervailing duty to offset what they would see as any unfair subsidies against Argentina's biodiesel. To make a long story short, uh, the whole point of that is uh, there may be changes in the works coming which end up protecting our U.S. 
uh, biodiesel producers, and that would have a protective effect on our soybean oil prices. So when I see these technical changes in the market, that is, we seem to be getting uh, a bounce of commercial support here down at a low price area uh, where you would normally expect price support to be. And we also see the stochastic uh, ever so slowly possibly starting to move higher. This looks uh, like the possibility of a bullish situation. But I would say not yet. So if Dave could take us to the daily slide. Here we have the July soybean oil contract on a daily basis. And as you can see there, it is still clearly in a downtrend. It's been in a downtrend since late January. Uh, the five-week high is currently a little bit above 34 cents. But a week from now, that, uh, that five-week high will drop to roughly 33 cents. So when that happens, uh, basically, if we saw a break or a close above the 33 cent level, uh, then I think it would be much more interesting uh, with bull possible bullish potential uh, that we could see a decent move in soybean oil. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for one more here. So uh, if I could go ahead, Dave. Uh, uh, this is crude oil, uh, another market of uh, uh, broad interest that I thought I would show up here. Uh, somewhat like um, uh, the S&P 500, I don't show the commercial position here for crude oil. And it's not because there aren't commercials and it doesn't make sense for commercials in crude oil. Definitely there, there are commercials involved in crude oil. But the problem is they're almost never long for any reason. Uh, and, and I don't totally understand it. But uh, for whatever reason, the, the typical signals and clues that we would look for in other markets uh, just don't show up in crude oil the way uh, it does for other commodities. I think the last time cr uh, commercials were long in crude was something like October of 2008. So you can see what a dire situation it takes uh, for, for commercials to go on the long side in crude oil. Uh, but what does make sense is looking at the, the uh, speculator positions. And in that, we have to adjust our framework a little bit in, in uh, realizing that uh, it's very rare that speculators go short in crude oil. And so uh, in this case, if we look to the left side of the chart, back in January when crude oil prices were trading well below their uh, expected lower band of volatility, uh, they got to $30 a barrel. That was the lowest price in 13 years. And uh, fundamentally, I mean, that's almost a, a Benjamin Graham type of opportunity. There's very few oil companies that could survive or make money uh, at a perpetual price of $30 a barrel. So that seemed to be a almost a once-in-a-lifetime type of opportunity. Uh, but um, uh, normally, in, in when something is that... Um, uh, bearish or, or miserable to be at a 13-year low, you would see speculators uh, on the short end of the market. Well, um, being long 200,000 contracts is kind of the equivalent of a bearish sentiment in crude oil uh, speculative positions. So it's a little bit of a different animal, but uh, you just have to uh, adjust accordingly. So that was uh, an extreme long-term uh, type of example uh, uh, or buying opportunity, I should say, at $30 a barrel. And it's going to be hard to replicate uh, that uh, again, I think. So that's, that can almost uh, stand as a, as a pivot mark of support, I would guess, for a long time in crude oil. Even though we have extremely high inventories right now, um, uh, it's going to be very hard to to get prices that cheap again. Not saying it's impossible, but uh, a, a lot of uh, bearish momentum factors had to come together to make that thirty dollars possible, and it, it's very hard to uh, replicate that. If we uh, move to a little more um, recent view of crude oil, you'll see that in February speculative open interest got to a very high level, almost 600,000 contracts. 
those that was a record uh, uh, holding of a uh, or, or I should say a record sign of bullish sentiment among speculators. And if we look up above, our price is at roughly $54 a barrel. We're somewhat near the upper end of the expected volatility band, but not really pushing higher. So um, there we had a, a very bullish play from speculators, but prices just really uh, weren't pushing through to new highs at all. So it, it seems to tell me that um, this market is probably overdone uh, now for the upside and probably much like crude oil needs to take time correcting back uh, technically anyway. That's how I see things. Now everybody knows uh, if you follow crude oil that OPEC agreed to cut production back on November 30th and that, that helps spur some of that buying and it certainly motivated that big uh, speculative element but I, I would guess that uh, we're going to have to see that calm down a bit before we see another good buying opportunity in crude oil. Um, let's go ahead to the daily chart. It, when we look at June crude oil here on the daily, uh, it's been a very choppy uh, scenario for the past five months. And uh, market prices, we can see, broke down there in March. We had quite a rebound here uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, but if you notice, the, the prices got right back up to the five-week high, around $54, and uh, that's where it got turned back. So uh, I don't see anything going on here, any, any reason to be uh, especially bullish about crude oil for now. I wouldn't, uh, I, I, I would expect more likely to see a, a choppy trading range ahead, perhaps biting time, uh, maybe wearing people out, getting their interest down before we have another uh, go at it. So hopefully that helps give you a, a, a little taste of, of uh, uh, how we look at charts here or, or look at markets here uh, at, at DTN. I'll be glad to take any questions and, and uh, uh, do anything I can uh, help you. Okay, I'll give me one second. Uh, okay, uh, why is your data faster, or how does it compare to CQG or anyone else for that matter? Okay, um, IQ feed, we receive our data direct from the exchanges. Uh, we don't uh, bundle the data. We don't uh, send it out on a refresh cycle. Uh, so our infrastructure is set up so that we get it as, you know, directly from the exchange and send it directly to the customer. Um, every tick, uh, tick by tick, uh, you know, we're set up so it doesn't matter how many ticks, it's not going to slow us down or, um, you know, we're not going to miss any ticks or anything like that. Um, probably 95% of the time, most of the major uh, data vendors are going to be side by side, tick by tick. You know, nobody's going to be any faster than anybody else in, in regular markets. It's when the market gets fast. Uh, it's when the, the vol uh, volatility or the uh, the volume increases e enormously is when you will see some of our competitors either starting to miss ticks or starting to consolidate their quotes or starting to bundle their quotes. Uh, or, or even slow down on their data feeds. But um, again, because of our, our infrastructure and the way that we're set up, uh, at least in today's volume, uh, this never reached the point where we had to uh, slow down or, or miss anything. Okay. Uh... If you have any more questions, please type them in the question box. Uh, what is this new thing, commercials? What is wrong with the old institutional investors versus retail? Is this part of the new raising prices for data feed scheme? <laughs> uh, commercials is, is a, a classification that's designated by the CFTC. So they, they provide this uh, open interest data to us. 
uh, and and uh, we take advantage of it. And uh, especially uh, among commodities, uh, we find it uh, very helpful because um, if, if you look at commercial behavior versus speculative behavior, you'll look at you'll see very two different animals. They have different motivations and they have different ways of behaving. And uh, so being able to identify which one of them is more active in the market at different times is very helpful. And maybe I should say a, a, an example of a commercial in, in corn obviously would be like a, a Cargill or an Archer Daniels or a, an ethanol plant, someone that uses the grain in their daily business and uh, has, has outlets for processing it processing it or, or moving it along to uh, more valuable sites. Okay. Uh, Can you explain, Todd, just a little bit what CFTC is, in case somebody doesn't know? Uh, the Commodity Future Trading Commission, it's uh, uh, our branch of government, which uh, sets the rules for futures trading and, and all the regulations that go along with it. So one of the services they provide uh, that CFTC data, which comes out every Friday, and it tells us as of the previous Tuesday uh, where the big players uh, line up in their positions. So it tells us uh, how many commercial longs there are or shorts there are, or on the non-commercial side, longs and shorts. And uh, that all that data is available to us and also accessible through your IF, or IQ feed. Okay. Uh, come on, questions. Okay, let's see. The uh, market research and insights provided by Todd, is that a separate service from the data feed? Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, yes. Now, we're, we all work for the same company, company DTN. Uh, I happen to work in our newsroom uh, where... Uh, we serve primarily agricultural customers who want farm news every day, and uh, I write for them uh, for market analysis. Um, so, okay. Okay. So, it is advantageous for the executions of our trades to be on IQ feed. That is what I'm understanding. Well, IQ feed is the data feed that's going to feed data into your charting uh, and analysis software program. Um, you so still IQ have not on the execution side, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. So we're we're not a we're not a broker. We don't link into brokers, but some of the software programs that we feed the data into will link directly to your broker, like NinjaTrader. Uh, if you use that, for example, then you can click right on the chart and it'll place the trade right with a Ninja broker, or I think they link into many other different brokers too, as do probably 30 or 40 of the uh, other software programs that we feed data into. So. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, this will be the last question. Um, do you all use Donchin channels in intraday trading in any of your analysis? Uh, I, I think that I think you would find that very difficult to do. Uh, I mean, I would say go ahead and simulate and, and uh, try the research on that, but my guess is that uh, when you go intraday, uh, it's probably too uh, choppy, too deceptive uh, to work. I, to be honest, I've never uh, I've never done the the uh, back testing research on that. I, I'd be interested to look at it, but uh, I, I would guess it probably would not work. Okay. All right. If you have any more questions, uh, Dave and Todd's um, contact information is on the screen. You can send them an email or give Dave a call if you're interested in signing up for IQ Feed. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for the webinar today, for the information, and most importantly, for your time. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Absolutely.